Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcast YouTube series. My guest is Sarah Glazer. She's a production sound mixer. And you've had probably one of the more interesting career paths of anyone I've met. You're not a musician. No. Which was one of the things that I found really interesting. So you entered on the tech side almost immediately. Right. I mean, I, I loved music. I asked my parents if I could learn, you know, multiple instruments. But um, music lessons were were not supported in, in the family group. In fact, my mother wouldn't even let me go into the music store, Tower Records. That was a waste of money and stuff. So I had my radio. Um, was it a dislike of music or was it a dislike of the music world and the, the connotations and stereotypes? It's sort of like you could appreciate the arts, but don't do them. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, art. Which is, of course, why you rebelled and got into the arts. I mean, yeah. I loved art, too. It was just like sometimes you're born with just an artistic soul. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, obviously, I mean, I've got a lot of art in my home. Even as a kid, I was paging through art books and, and staring at that. I would want to go on a day after the museum. I'd want to listen to music. I had no sports gene in me, um, to, to, so I, it was not a good fit in the family for that because mm -hmm. they were all about that went off to college and you know so kind of had that allowance for the first time and, and getting a job and um, spend everything on music you know start going to concerts and when I could afford them and stuff with friends and so that that all happened once I got out of the house and I was off you know mm -hmm. at school and then uh, I was an Allman Brothers fan and the the for those that are familiar with the Allman Brothers their uh, support taping um live taping and bootlegging oh, right of course and mm -hmm. and you're in the fan club they do they they let you tape their shows they circulate the tapes and so that opened up the world of live sound to me and live shows that mm -hmm. i couldn't get to and so i got involved in those trees and and started uh tape trading and and building my collection through through live shows and a lot of the people who were uh, seeding the trees, as we call it, um, were recording engineers who'd been, you know, Wally Hyder, Fantasy, all that. And so they'd worked a session. So they were like, oh, I've got a good cat. I've got a DAT or, you know, we'll clone it and then we'll low generation this and we'll do this. And I've got a Denon deck and uh, clean heads and, you know, soundboard patches and started getting just hanging out on the boards it was kind of i was still text-based internet back then and so you know right, bbs right. boards and just i would ditch class just read everything on these boards the recording tidbits their stories all the things you know i didn't know what half of it meant but i was just reading it and soaking it up and then ditching class and going to shows started buying you know vinyl and then looking who was on the liner notes who were the musicians and trying to find out who played with who that's that's how you know my introduction to music happened now Let's jump from that for a minute, because at a certain point, you obviously also started started the jump to being interested in the tech side of that. Right. So How'd that happened. A girlfriend told me that, uh, you know, I always talked about music. I should do something with it. And I didn't feel at the time I I didn't want to be in front of on stage in the spotlight. I had, you know, confidence issues and stuff, but I wanted to be involved in the creative process. And she knew of a person at the recording engineering program over at UCLA. So she drove over to that person, got the catalog, came over, put it in my hand and said, you need to do something. Let's go. All you talk about is music. So when fall came around, instead of going back to complete um, my degree, I went to UCLA and enrolled in the recording engineering uh, program, the songwriting program and the music business program. And so, yeah, I enrolled in all three. Basically, bit off a whole lot all at yes. once. I actually thought I was going to be a songwriter and I thought I should do the recording engineering to learn about the process and also do that in the music business because, you know, we, we you know, you're going to take advantage of, get taken advantage of. You might as well learn about the business. That's just to that, go into the was... business and not learn about the business just seemed dumb. <laughs> well, but that was a very clear eyed thing because a lot of people yeah. don't. Yeah, I was like, well, stance. if I'm going to go, I got to learn how this 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 mm -hmm. works. So okay. 
the first year of the of the recording engineering um program for me was like the start off with like intro to physics so you know that that's not exactly <laughs> going to make you fall in love with it nobody said there'd be math then we got to our first practice session which was over at ocean way and uh, you know we had we're at ocean way we're in the big room a um we got bands there we've set up microphones we're actually doing it and we're tracking we're taking turns in the mo- at the board so it was my turn i walk up my finger touches a fader and i go to la la land and it was like oh i was in the middle of the mix i was doing the thing i forgot who i was because i was just doing it I think a tap on the shoulder. Okay, we need to share. And I knew a couple things. One, that was it. I'd found it and I needed more of it. And after hearing, you know, my musician friends talk about how when they play, they go to that special place where they're just, mm-hmm. they're, they kind of go a little outside of themselves. And then I was like, that happened when I touched a fader. And that was the moment that it clicked for me. At what point did this click for you that, oh, this is actually something that I can do for a living. Was it when? Was it really? That didn't come that for finger? years later. <laughs> and and my my definition of making a living has changed. Well, over there. yeah, okay. <laughs> you got a subsistence. Is that the phrase we want here? Yeah, yeah. like you know, um, you know, I've got a roof over my head. Um, I've got health insurance and gas in the car. I might not have food on the table, but that's okay. I'll just you know. Yeah, but 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 what I'm saying, I mean, yeah, jokes yeah, yeah. aside, yeah. what I'm saying is there's a point at which shit gets real. You know. Well, I um, I got a strong streak of stubborn, so um, really, yeah, it's a shocker. Oh, I know, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like if you tell me it's not going to work, I'm I'm going to say, oh, oh yeah. So what, you're, so what you're saying here is mom was an inspiration. <laughs> no, um, it was more that this made me so happy, mm-hmm. and I loved it so much. That it became more important than anything else. I'd never, uh, okay. I'd never had something that meant so much to me before about engineering and 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 music and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I was going to do whatever I had to um, to make this work. And if it meant I had a day job and I went into the studio at night, then I did that for a couple of years till the studio could take me on full time. And then I quit the day job, and I would just make it work. Or what I would do a lot of was I would do temp work. So I do temp work in an office, you know, around the music social and that made yeah. enough so that I could, you know, get by. Now, living paycheck to paycheck and it was like, you know, this was back when it was like, you know, my income was maybe 1500 a month. You know, this is, you know, half of that was rent. It was like, you can't do that these days. Right. Everything costs more. So it was like the last bit, you know, $10 an hour, if you could get it, it was a great job. But, you know, when I started, minimum wage was $4.50 and 33 cents for mileage. So, you know, you weren't, there's a reason all the, uh, the, all the runners had like five roommates. In the yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now we've talked about this before. So I'm, uh, and, and I, I kind of want to trace the whole arc here. So I don't want to get too deep into a rabbit hole on one particular thing or another, but you started out in audio recording and you ended up in a much different place. Well, I'm still recording audio. Well, yes, in you are. In a completely are. different... In a yeah. completely in different... Just, not just a completely different job, because... So so to clarify here, you started off in, as music. in, in a recording studio environment. In, yes, in and, a very good right. high-end recording studio right. in L.A. Yeah. So you're still an audio recordist, quote-unquote. I love that word, recordist. Somebody made that up somewhere from some marketing person. Yeah, that's that up, it. Right? But you're doing a completely different job in terms of doing it for film. Right. And more importantly, it's a different world, it's a different Absolutely. culture, it's a different language. Yeah, your networking does not cross very well. In this. Yeah, exactly. And I'm interested in that transition. I'm interested in how you went from studio to film. When I left Devonshire, um, I thought that was going to be it for a while i just took a i took one of the temp jobs as a permanent job just to get some income and just do that while i sorted it out and then i had the opportunity at that point to uh go work for eric dosh at sound chamber mastering where which was um they did restoration on film 
Mm -hmm. Then um, I had the opportunity to go on tour. <laughs> and um, there's another different world. I loved it. I was offered to go uh, on a full tour with Al Green. I came back from the tour and the post studio went out of business. We all got laid off. Music was still not in a good place. It was kind of the same or worse since then. They weren't, studios were going out of business. Pro Tools was taking over. Mm -hmm. People were doing home studios. They didn't want to hire assistant engineers. Um, there was kind of a downsizing going on. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there trying to figure out what I could still do in sound. I had always said I was never going to do anything in film or television. I was just going to do music. Famous last words. Didn't even take always. any. Didn't always. even take any of the classes related to film or television because I was mm -hmm. just going to do music. You yep. know, I didn't know anybody um, in that world. I uh, a friend of mine growing up. His father had been a film, a television producer, and. Um, so I spoke to him and he was like, well, you know, if you wanted to go into producing, I could 100% help you out and DGA and all that. And I was like, no, I still want to do sound. And he was like, well, I don't know how to help you with that. You should call the union. So I called the union before I'd even done a job, really. And Interesting. Asked, Normally they would blow you off, wouldn't no, they? I called and I was like, what do I have to do to get in the union? Because what I knew from music is if there's a union, I want to be in it. Right. Because <laughs> I want to get paid. Yeah. Not, not mm -hmm. used to having to fight to get paid, having people renegotiate or not pay you because they don't know what they're doing. Yep. I was, that's the, I, I love what I do. I hate that business part of it. So I found out what you had to do to get on the industry experience roster and, you know, how to get days, what they count, minimum, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Craigslist because I didn't know anything else. And there's this little section called gigs. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just started doing a whole bunch of low budget and student films. And <clears throat> nowadays, all those f types of shoots are union. Yeah. Um, they're in the tier contracts. But back when I got in, they were still non-union. November um, 2nd, 2005, I got sworn into the union, uh, Viazzi Local 695 for production sound. I was doing, you know... The world of, of low-budget feature films, if there's anything you should, uh, you know, think of when you think of that, think of Roger Corman. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're like, all right, we got this much money, we're going to make a film, we're going to go out there. A lot of horror films, a lot of that. You know, one of the things that is interesting to me is the idea of being plugged into the creative process. And you're plugged into it now in a completely different way and on a completely different level. Yes. And I think that that's one that a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of. Well, you know, I, it's like, wow, is that's a job? I mean, I you had know? no idea, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and production sound is the least recognized, I think. There's a lot more knowledge and exposure in, to the post world of film. Um, because you can go into a studio and an engineer can sit there and do that. But on set... It's hard to bring another person on set who's not a part of the thing. It was certainly a lot easier before COVID. And even then, when you're on set in the sound department, half the other, most, most of the people on set are like, we know we need you. We know what good sound sounds like, but we don't necessarily know what you do. Even our producers and directors are like, can you do that? Right. There's, there's, okay, cool, not, just do it. Yeah, yeah as opposed yeah. to when you were in the studio and you're working with your band and your producers and your engineers, and pretty much everybody's got that language of the technical down to some degree. To the point is when you're on, when you're on, a, on a film set or, or a television show set, um, everybody is there for what it looks like on camera. And there are three people on set who are there for the sound, and that is the production sound mixer, the boom operator, and the sound utility. And we are fighting an uphill battle most of the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, we, we work hard to get the performance and we are, you know, but, you know, even though we give people headsets on, on set, they don't always listen because, again, they're very visually focused. The costumes right? Are the hair right? Is the makeup right? Is the set right? Is this in focus? Is that the right camera angle? Do I want this shot? Let's talk about the performance. You know, all of that first. They're not going to usually notice what the sound department's going to notice there because they're paying attention to everything else. Sometimes they do. And then they'll get into post and it's like they're hearing it for the first time, you know. Right. And that's where they're asking you to fix it. And if it didn't Why get recorded yeah. the first time. Yeah, exactly. So um, 
again, it all depends who you're working with. There's, there's a, there's a very common saying that, you know, pretty much every first director's film sounds horrible because they'll, you know, not budget for properly. Not, not, and so everybody else. learns they need new, need good sound. Mm -hmm. What takes a while for most people to learn is what constitutes good sound or what do I need to get good sound? And pretty much most, most directors or producers will go through a few mixers in the process um, as they as they learn more about what good sound involves and as they get more educated about what they need and also, you know, what they need to budget for it. Well, but the main point here, I think, at least if, if, I, if I get your gist here, the main point is that everybody thinks they can fix it after the fact and people are not necessarily conscious of the fact that you need to capture it Yes. well in the beginning. And so when I switched over production sound, I was coming from restoration. Mm. So I could walk you up to my directors to right away and it's like, I can't, that's not fixable. We have to go again. Yeah. yeah you know, because exactly. 2003, it was like, um, <coughs> you know, nowadays we have these amazing tools. We have isotope and, and denoisers and stuff that do amazing things. Mm -hmm. The technology's come a long, long way, and that has made a lot more things possible that were not possible when I was switching over. So, sure. you know, it, it, it helped that I got and I was able to present um, sort of a continuation of the of the old school protocol of like, we, we do need to get this and you do need to get room tone and you do need to get these things so that you actually have your film. Yeah, and I think that's part of it too is coming to something with an old school understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, I have had conversations with a lot of people who've learned recording on a DAW. Right. And what they don't understand is a lot of the elementary signal flow. Right. And those people who have learned on analog or at least gotten exposed to it have a different understanding of how that signal flow works. And if you learn those rules, you know, same, so the same thing applies obviously to what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there were, it was interesting. Each time I switched careers, I had to retrain my brain and my ears in different ways. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, when you're recording, you're hearing the sounds. When you're mixing, you're breaking it down. When you're doing restoration, it's all the elements in production sound instead of EQing things in you mostly want to EQ out yeah. but then you also don't want to and so you pretty much do like a high pass filter right but um you don't want to get too aggressive on that because you're not mixing it and you're not going to get it back but yeah. this isn't a song where it's like you can right. EQ a song you can EQ an instrument for the length of a song and then the next song could be different um and then that's an album it's a section but with this you're shooting you're shooting a feature. You could shoot it, you know, over rooms, over a month. Yeah, exactly. In all these different locations, and you can't EQ that actor differently for each location because yeah. then you've got a robot in one scene. Another. I mean, and, and then let's we can get into how how aggressive you are with EQ. Not not only that, but I mean, even down to even, even if you're in the, the same coverage. location and the weather changes, or well, the or even and, even yeah. just if you're in a scene. In different coverage, you shoot part of it before lunch, part of it after lunch. It yep. starts raining. Somebody parks a generator next exactly. door, you know. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you're shooting the inside in one location and the outside at another location. All these things. So you actually have to keep it... You have to allow post to do most of that because they're... Once, although we shoot this, I have no idea what takes they're going to use. Right. Um, from so which shots, and all you know. That, yeah. It, well, yeah. And then when they cut it together, picture editors especially when you're getting started, the, when everybody's getting started and learning on student films and whatnot, mm -hmm. I have found that most of those picture editors, they don't, they have to learn about sound too. Mm -hmm. So they'll cut things in weird places that don't make sense sonically because they're looking to that. And then, um, you know, oh, they'll add effects to that for their temp dialogue track for their edit. Then all of that gets replaced in the final mix and stuff where they go back to your your tracks. The dialogue editor's gone in, it's cleaned it up. You've got your effects, you've got your music. It all comes together and then everything shines. So you really want to get the best tracks that you can for your post mixers so that they can really polish what you've given them and actually make everything shine. And then overall, you know, it's a kind of a group mix in that respect. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then everybody looks good as yeah. opposed to like, if you really paint them in a corner and you know, which, which makes sense. But then the other thing is like your director and producer can have a complete change of direction in post as well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's really no undo button. Yeah. So we're getting down rabbit holes, which we're both really good at. Yes, we are. But I want to go back to a little bit about your career path because there's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts there. And you know, part of it is the whole idea of being a woman in this industry, which is, I, I've heard there's some challenges there. Um, <laughs> well, I was very fortunate um, when I touched the fader and decided I wanted to do this. Um, I was sending out resumes to every studio in town for a month and nobody was even calling me back. And um, that was frustrating. And I spoke with um, so this woman who was a musician and was in one of my engineering classes or one of my songwriting classes. She was from New York. And when we had this conversation, I told her I was, nobody was even calling me back. But meanwhile, I was watching the guys, you know, getting jobs. She says, you need to call Bill Dooley. He hires women. And I said, well, who's Bill Dooley? you know, get me his information. And she knew him from New York, you know, when he, you know, been mm -hmm. at the record plant. So she said, all right, I'll find out for you. So she actually, and I, I, I she found his information and got it to me. And uh, I sent my resume in and he called me the next day, called me in for an interview the next day. I walk in, he says, I hired women. I, I had, I've had female, you know, assistants. They're great. And uh, they hear better. And um, we're having the conversation. He asked me, you know, I, again, I didn't know the first thing about Bill. All I knew was like, I wanted to do this and, you know, I'd been following names on, on my albums for a while. And there's one name that stood out to me on all the albums I loved. And so I decided I want to be that person again, not even knowing what that person had done. Um, and so when Bill asked me in the interview, you know, what I want to be, I told him I want to be the next Tom Dowd. <laughs> well... <laughs> Little did I know, That's, not uh, only, mm, not only yeah. everything Tom had done, I just knew I saw his name on all the, the albums that I loved and I wanted to make albums like he made, mm -hmm. you know, which is a great place to start. And not knowing yeah. that Bill had been hired after, you yes. know, so, yes. so I told him that and, and, um, he started laughing probably. Huh? He did not start laughing. He just looked at me and he told me I was hired. <laughs> Uh -huh. So, uh, and man, what a joy he was to work with. Um, he's the reason I'm still here because he never treated me uh, as anything less than an engineer. When we needed a studio manager, he didn't even interview me. I found out after the fact and I said, well, you know, I wasn't going to offer because I didn't want to be a studio manager. But I, I said to him, I said, you didn't ask me. And he said, no, you're an engineer. And that was it. And yeah. that was it. Bill Dooley told me I was an engineer. He said, I'm an engineer. It didn't matter what anybody else said. Well, and I think... It's not just that you had a supportive person there, because obviously you did, yeah. but that then empowers you to be stronger for any of the adversity that inevitably does come your way. True. And then also, you know, Bill being Bill, like for mm -hmm. those of us who knew him, he was like, you know, he would just, when the Neve needed something, he'd pull out the schematic, pull out the module, open it up and start repairing. Yep. You know, the yep. first six months I was working at Brooklyn, we were building that room. So that was a unique experience because we had the um, the Motown West 8078. And then five weeks after I got there, the 8080 from Hit Factory arrived. And the first six months were joining the two consoles, the rebuild, mm -hmm. and then the joining of the two consoles, the monitor, monitor section, which Bill put in the center of the room so you could mix from the sweet spot. And then all the, we had, you know, Brooklyn, for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, it's no longer around. But it was a boutique mix studio. We had walls and walls yes. of outboard gear. We had Fairchilds. We had the old Pulse X with the, with the um, you know, telephone amps in them. We had just LA two ways, you know, um, mm -hmm. distress everything that you could possibly want. Um, really, it was it was a very very old school, amazing studio with yes. great room, um, um, you know. Uh, Acoustics were uh, Vincent von Hoff, you know, mm -hmm. was, was there doing that. Yeah. We were actually, George Massenberg was um, developing his new GML faders at the time. We were the first studio to have it. So while we were doing this and reorienting the room and, and all sorts of that, George was coming down and, and, and troubleshooting, you know, in fact, the manual came out, you know, months after we were reopened and 
we got it. And we're like, oh, hey, cool. Let's check this out. Let's see what's in this yeah. troubleshooting. Mm-hmm. And um, we laughed because one of the funny ones in there is, why is there food in my console? Nice. Don't eat over the console. Exactly. But um, yeah. Okay, but I, I, I wanted to redirect you, and here's why. Mm. Because you and I are talking tech, and I want to talk about you. Well, okay? all right. Where I was going with that was just um, to have an engineer like Bill who was that good at what he did, mm-hmm. um, who taught me so much while I was there and was so well respected that it really didn't matter because most of the... It empowered you. It empowered me yeah. because when you get somebody of that caliber saying, no, you're an engineer and you're good, mm-hmm. so you are, you, you hold on to that and it'll get you through everything else. And I think the other aspect of that too is that by being perceived and no let me rephrase that by perceiving yourself as an engineer by having that self-awareness of i'm an engineer and i'm confident in that that tends to um that tends to diffuse a lot of the sexism you know yeah. be, coming in yeah, confident he, he treated me as an equal yeah uh, in everything so i wasn't i was <clears throat> just an engineer i wasn't the female engineer right exactly and huge th- and that to me is is the best part of it you know when i talk to so many women in this industry one of the one of the common threads is you know what sucks is having to be in a situation where you have to be confrontational yes. where you have to assert yourself as a woman because then what happens is you immediately have this uncomfortable situation you know, and you're, you're working side by side with people. So if you can manage to, if one can manage to create a situation where gender is disqualified as a, as a subject right. right away, then that empowers you to say, okay, we've cut through that shit. Now let's get to work. Yeah. And I think that is one of the most beautiful things about almost every successful woman in this industry that I've met is that it's not about god damn it you're going to respect me because i'm a woman in this industry it's you're going to respect me and you're going to ignore the fact that i'm a woman the same way i'm going to ignore the fact that you're a man we don't bring our genitalia to work unless you're flea you know (laughs) no you're going to respect me because i'm damn good at what i do exactly exactly and you know i want to hire somebody you're going to want to work with me because i'm damn good at what i do i want to hire somebody because they're a damn good engineer and because they're intuitive and because they have the skill set and they have the understanding and as you were saying earlier they know how to listen yeah and all of those aspects have zero to do with your gender 100 percent. yeah and i think that's to me, if there's hope for the future in terms of bringing more women into the industry, it's that more than anything else. Yeah. It's that it's not that we want to have more women, it's that we want to have more humans. I'm just looking for equality and, yeah. you know, yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, it was interesting. I just got into this business and didn't see any women and I didn't think about that. I wasn't thinking about that because all I was thinking about was I loved this and this is what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the, once I, once I got hired by Bill, I could get a job after that because I had Bill as a reference. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then the, so it really didn't impact me that way until I started, um, um, I decided I wanted to try to do some live stuff with some local bands. And, uh, that didn't work because although the band and I got along great and we loved the sound and all that. The lead singer's girlfriend did not want a female engineer Ooh, to go out. Nice. You know? I think that, that you know, they're, Insecurity. They, mm-hmm. they call me like, we love you. We'd like to hire you and take you out. But his girlfriend it doesn't want you to sleep with him. And I'm like, that's not even on the table. Yeah, hello. <laughs> but it didn't matter because, you know, obviously they had issues. But that, you know, um, I, I loved live sound when I went. It was such a rush to mix that. Mm-hmm. and But that... Um, <clears throat> There were there were a lot fewer opportunities then than there are now. Sure. Um, in that world for me, and I, outside of um, you know Lewis McKay who brought me on Val Green, I didn't know um, anybody. And the one you know I met one other person, but uh, they were more interested in sleeping with me than anything else, and so that completely turned me off of that. Yeah. And so, you know, 
the film ended up working and going in as the mixer, I was going in as the department head. You found something you love. I did. You found something you feel good about, you're good at, yes. you are accepted as a professional, respected as a professional. What could be bad, you know? Yeah, and and then I actually was getting paid okay, too. You know, getting paid is really a good thing, you know? Now, granted, in the non-union stuff, I won't say the pay was okay. I was just used to living on a lot less, right, you know? Right, we all know that. You know, I mean, I'd gone from making four fifty, four dollars and fifty cents an hour plus thirty three cents of mileage to you know a hundred dollars a day, two hundred dollars a day. It was, Ooh, yeah. You now know. mom can get that operation, right? Well, <laughs> I won't go that far, <laughs> but we can start buying food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, me... but then, then, then once I, you know, got in the union <clears throat> and started, you know, networking and making friends, and then, um, you know, none of this happens overnight. Um, and then when I started working at the union level, um, wow, that, that, and working consistently at, at the union level on, on good projects, that was a game changer mm -hmm. because now all you had to do was, you know, find the jobs and find the people to hire you or the people you want to hire and all that, which is still a lot. But because of the union, I don't have to go negotiate by rate. If they're paying scale, sure. ne negotiate the gear. But then if they don't pay me, the union goes out and fights for me and stuff, which mm -hmm. is great. Yeah. You know, um, there's pension, there's health care. Um, you can you can you can have a better life. So um, that was really nice. Now that, that takes a while for some of us and some people don't. Everybody ends up where they end up. I've been fortunate. It's worked out for me and I've done well and. You're always looking to work more, work on better projects, work on, you know, the types of projects you want to work on. And it's nice when that's reflected in the bank account, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the thing that's different about film is the more experience everybody gets, producers, directors, and all that, and the more they make it, the more they learn what's important, their budgets grow, and you work your way up. Mm -hmm. uh, of the tree, you get more discerning, and you get better projects. You get better crew, and um, it, it, you kind of you kind of rise in the ranks, mm -hmm. and the work, the quality of work, and the people and the pay go with that. Um, it pays off, and in in, mm -hmm. in in more than one way, in 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 when you're working at a higher level, they usually want the best sound from you, so there's support sure. to get there. So. You know, you gotta, you've got to cut your teeth in the, in the, uh, in the lower levels and on union and the tier, you know, to, to learn how to do that. But, you know, the cream tends to rise to the crop in any, in any industry. Sure. And of um, people like you and you're good at what you do and, and your work ethic speaks for itself, you'll, you'll do all right. Well, and let's take that full circle then because a lot of our audience who watch these episodes are younger students, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to go to the whole, you know, what would you tell 15 year old you, but there is a certain aspect of that, isn't there? I mean, when you were coming up and you didn't know what you wanted to be when you grew up and all of that, you know, what would you say to somebody coming into the industry now? Ah, uh, um, you know, I get actually asked that question quite a bit. I got asked that question the other day at a mixer where, you know, people are coming in in trainee positions or they're thinking about moving out to L.A. and like, what should we do? Mm -hmm. um, the world's changed. Um, yes. You know, I, I will say a lot of people in our industry are on Facebook. Love it or hate it, it's great for networking. Mm -hmm. So if you're coming out here to L.A., you know, find... If you know anybody, um, reach out to them. If you don't know somebody, reach out to them. You might yep. get lucky. The worst they can do is ignore you or say no, and they might say yes. Um, offer to take them out for coffee or something, or you know, buy them a drink, or mm -hmm. you know, can you pick your brain? I'm a fan. I love exactly. this film. You know, yep. and then uh, join any local sound groups you can find. Uh, find out, you know, talk to your friends, ask them if they can introduce you to anybody else. Mm -hmm. Do that, and if you're coming in. 
out of school, talk to uh, maybe some of the school. I, after I did the recording program at UCLA, they kept calling me to do sound on their student film projects. And every single time I kept telling them, I was like, guys, I work in a recording studio. This isn't what I do. Even the people running the program didn't understand the difference. Mm -hmm. you yeah. know? So maybe go talk to like the local film schools and say, hey, I want to do sound. Do you have students uh, who are, need a sound mixer? You know, um, you know, go to the local sound stores. Out here in LA, we've got Location Soundcore, we've got True Audio, we've got Audio Department. Go talk to them, say I'm new. You know, can I get a, either get a job here or learn? That's another good thing you do. You get a job in the tech department or rentals, you're learning the gear and you're meeting everybody who's coming in and renting and you're networking. At some point you can, you know, know what to do, go out there and start working on set. There's a sure. lot of different avenues. And um, if you're going to start on student films, which is not a bad thing, <clears> and the low budget stuff, you'll, you'll learn the gear, you'll, you'll get some experience, then get in the union whenever you can. And when you get in the union, my advice, and this was advice that was given to me by somebody and it was given to him and it's been passed around through the generation. So if you like it, use it. If you don't, don't. But the advice was when you, when you do get into the union, um, think about not joining as a mixer or join as a boom op or a utility. Because in the non-union world, there's a lot of one-man bands or one-person bands, we say. You got a bag, you're booming, you're mixing, you're doing everything. Um, if, you, if you enjoy doing that and that's what you want to do, congratulations. Keep doing it. If you want to do narrative, there's a different dynamic. There's a mixer, a boom up, and a utility, and you have to learn how that department functions with those different uh, roles, who does what, and how we interact with the other departments on set. So mm. if you want to do narrative, I'd say come in as a utility, and then you can be trained to be a boom up because booming as a one person band sound department is not like booming on narrative. They're completely different. Well, it also gives you then the opportunity to network with more different people. Yes, that's the other thing. If you're a utility, any utility, you can come as a utility one day, a boom up, and you can day play and go between different mixers. You might, you might really enjoy those, and mm -hmm. you might decide you don't want to mix, or you might do that, really learn how to to do the department, and then move up to mixing. At which point you'll know a lot of people, mm -hmm. and you can start maybe mixing second units on your friends' shows. Yeah. And so there's there's a way, but it's all networking and all of that. And so, you know, of course, if you're if you have a parent who is in the business and they can just slot you in, go do that. More power to you. But, but most people don't. But there's a <laughs> lot of people who don't. So um, I, I that was the path I you know I was given that advice. I followed it. It worked for me because the thing is, is when I came in as a mixer, um, without a background in film. I was understanding that there were times my boom up was lit out or he couldn't do things. And since I didn't have that experience on set as a boom up or as a utility, I couldn't really help him. Mm -hmm. And to me, the mixer, you know, if you're going to run the department, you got to know how to do every job. And that's a truism that applies across the entire industry. Right. The more you understand about doing other jobs, even if you don't really do them, it makes you the better, better you're going to be yeah. at your job. Because so then after I've done those jobs, coming back as a mixer, I know what my crew is up against. Yep. I know what they're doing. Yep. I know what they're able to do. I understand when they're getting painted in a corner, they can't give it. I'm like, oh, okay, I know. All right, that's, you know, that light's mm -hmm. boning you. You got a shadow here. Oh, we just threw up a third camera and a lens and now you can't get that one line. I'll get that on the wire. And you learn how you're going to approach this. Not only does it make you a better mixer, but when your crew knows you've done their job and they're good at it, they love it when you understand that. Yes. The, so I, I literally, I remember one time as a utility, I was working with a boom up, amazing boom up, and um, just super talented. He's retired now, Mark Jennings. And um, Mark flat out said, he's like, I won't work for any mixer who hasn't boomed. Won't go yeah. there. Well, and I think, as I say, I think that really yeah. applies across the board. You know, if, um, if you've been a second engineer, you know what that job is. If sure. you've been an engineer, you know. Therefore, you can intuit yeah. a lot of what they're going through, and that's important too. Yeah, you. I don't <clears throat> think you can truly run a department if you haven't done every job in the department and you don't understand how everybody interacts together and do that. Mm -hmm. You know. After I was an engineer, I went 
I went and started wiring in studios sure. so that I could understand that aspect sure. of it. You know, sure. all of that is important because it gives you that global perspective. It gives you that 30,000 foot view of yeah. everything that's going on. No, when I, when, I, <coughs> when I switched to utility for a few years, and every job that I was a utility on, I was always the second boom, and we second boomed everything. So I was a boom operator as well all the time, and very good at both jobs. Um, and I, I, I really enjoyed both of them. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, I almost to the point where I was like, oh, do I really need to mix? But then I sat back in the chair and I was like, Oh no, I need it. This you need is... to do. I I think I'm really, a mixer. Yeah. You you know yeah. when you're a yeah. Yeah, and you know when you need to understand all those other aspects of things. Well, yeah, and even <coughs> even one of my friends is like Sarah. He's like, I I know you're working as a utility or boomer. And he's like, but you're a mixer. You know, he's like, I just think of you as a mixer who's working as <laughs> as a boom up right now. And then and another another boom up that I'd worked with for years. When I told him that I was returning to mixing, he said, oh, thank goodness. He's like, you were always a mixer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you just, you know. You find your place. You find your thing. So, yeah. you know, go do what you need to do to be the best whatever job you want to do. But learning every job in the department, trying that to see if it fits you is invaluable. Wise words. Sarah Glazer, thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much, Neil. And for those watching at home, this is Stella. This is Darius. And this is Goat, <laughs> who okay. have uh, upstaged us. And they have us. attended the entire session. <laughs> yes, we had a lot to say, too. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.